floor. But we are moving on. I would like to introduce Matt Segal. Most of you know Matt um, very well. And, uh, but he did submit a bio, so I'm going to take the time to read it. He, you know, he, he took the time to write it, so I'm going to read it. Matt is a doctoral candidate at PCC, whose dissertation focuses on the role of imagination in the philosophy of nature, especially as exemplified in the work of Whitehead, Schilling, and the Western esoteric tradition. He blogs regularly about this and other topic topics at footnotescoplato.com, which I would highly recommend. It is a treasure trove of amazing ideas that will break your brain into a thousand pieces. Uh, Matt Seagal. Thanks, Darren. In a good way. In a good way. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Really glad to be here with you briefly. I'm actually working upstairs, so I'm sneaking out during lunch to do this. Uh, and then I have to sneak back. But uh, Laura's doing the same thing. Um, so the title of, of my presentation is War of the Worlds, Love and Strife in the Pluriverse. Um, I'm going to present to you a sort of uh, metaphysical scheme. You know, this is a cosmology of love. Cosmology traditionally is understood as a branch of metaphysics. So I'm going to start there and then work my way towards um, you know, building a sort of metaphysical scheme and then work my way towards the political and cosmological implications of that. Uh, and this is very much still a work in process. Um, it's unfinished, but part of what I'm going to try to suggest is that the nature of our reality is also unfinished, in process, uh, open-ended, and that it's a collaborative enterprise. It will always be a collaborative enter enterprise to continue finding ways to allow it to, this pluriverse, to hang together as a whole. Um, so, metaphysics. There's been a lot of criticism, um, uh, especially in the last century or so, about how it can be violent. Um, when a metaphysician claims to know the nature of reality, to, to be able to say to everyone, this is how it is, um, that usually ends up um, covering over, or at, at, uh, at best, assimilating other perspectives uh, to one's own. Um, and that's a violent act. So. You know, a lot of postmodernists have tried to say, oh, well, let's just be done with metaphysics then. Um, my perspective is that uh, that's naive and that as speaking animals, uh, as animals possessed by language, we're inherently metaphysical. We're going to be asking these questions about the nature of reality. So instead of pretending like we could avoid it, we can try to do it in a more diplomatic way. So... In the modern period, there have been two basic metaphysical schemes. Um, monism, on the one hand, represented by thinkers like uh, Spinoza, uh, most famously, and then dualism. Uh, of course, Descartes would be the most famous dualist. And both of these approaches, I think, are, um, are violent in the sense that, uh, you know, a monist, if whether you're an idealist, monist, who says that ultimately there is one mind and all finite minds are in one way or another illusory and that they reduce to this one mind, or whether you're a materialist monist who says that mind itself is an illusion and what there really is is just this, this sea of material particles randomly colliding, um, both of those approaches are violent and in some sense elitist in that the monist or the dualist is saying, oh, you don't get it. What you think, what you perceive reality to be how you experience in a merely folk psychological way or a common sense way what reality is, that that's an illusion. You need my special knowledge uh, in order to understand what's really going on. So the monist and the dualist are both in their own ways asking you to sort of, you know, check your common sense experience of the world uh, at the gate, come into their little metaphysical realm and accept the truth, the truth that they have discovered. Now, as an alternative, uh, form of metaphysics, I'm going to put forward um, a form of pluralism. Okay, so not monism, not dualism, but pluralism. Um, and I think pluralism is an inherently more diplomatic uh, form of, of metaphysics because, um, well, first of all, it welcomes everyone's perspective to the table. Um, it's not 
elitist. It's not engaged in, you know, what Whitehead would refer to one of my major teachers as, um, it's not engaged in attempting heroic feats of explaining away, right, like the dualist or the monist would. We're not trying to explain away anything. We're welcoming everything. If you experience it, it's part of the nature of reality and it needs to be included in our understanding. Um, so I think pluralism is inherently more diplomatic in that sense that it's welcoming difference, it's welcoming the unknown, it's welcoming the unfinished nature of things. Um, but when I talk about pluralism here in a metaphysical context, right, this is ontological pluralism, this is not merely cultural pluralism. That's important too. But I'm not talking about um, a plurality of different ways of relating to the world or uh, a plurality of ways of knowing the world. Um, I'm not talking about multiple worldviews. I'm talking about multiple worlds, multiple realities. So for you know, a lot of the, in the 1990s, there was this, this, this grand idea of multiculturalism, right? That we could all learn to tolerate one another's differences. Um, we could all have our own sort of cultural attire. We could all have um, our own holidays off from work and our own aisle in the grocery store and, 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 you know, a representative percentage of our own color of faces on TV. And that society could sort of get along um, in that multicultural context so long as, at the end of the day, we were actually cosmological nihilists and cultural relativists, and that we accepted that really there's only one way of knowing, which is science, and that it tells us the truth about that one underlying reality called nature, that all cultures um, ultimately have to be, um, you know, when they're honest with themselves, they admit that, yeah, we know, you know, we celebrate our rituals and our holidays and stuff, but ultimately there's this one natural world and science tells us what it is. That was the sort of uh, the idealistic vision um, that I think our society had in the 90s. And then 9-11 happened and we realized, whoa, cultural difference is way more intense than we thought and that's not gonna work anymore. Um, so I wanna distinguish ontological pluralism from any kind of multicultural pluralism or pluralism of worldviews. This is more radical. This is multiple worlds, multiple realities. Not multiculturalism, but multinaturalism, if you will. Now, in this context, the question of truth maybe comes to mind. What is truth if there are multiple realities? Um, one thing I don't want to suggest is that, is that pluralism is a kind of relativism where anything goes. You can say whatever you want and it is, is just as true as what anyone else says. Um, that would be the relativity of truth. What I'm saying is, is the reverse. It's the truth of relativity. Reality itself is built of relationship and what is true um, requires a different sort of metric. You don't measure the truth anymore by trying to um, line up how you think or feel about the world subjectively with how it actually is objectively because again there is no objective way that the world is independent of our views of it from this ontological pluralist perspective. Truth instead I think takes on more of a um, an ethical and an aesthetic uh, vector so we gauge whether something is true based on how beautiful it is and based on um, the ethics of it. Is it leading to greater suffering to say that, to hold that some particular perspective is true or is it relieving suffering, right? So rather than this more abstract sense of truth as the correspondence between um, a subject's representation and the way that the world is, it's a more pragmatic understanding of truth. You know, it's truth that we need to always construct together uh, it's truth not just by consensus, like we vote on it or something, um, but it's, it's a truth that only becomes apparent uh, as we begin to practice as though a particular point of view were true. We see the fruits of that practice and gauge whether or not um, it seems more beautiful or, or is leading to a more ethical way of being. Um, so ontological pluralism then implies a kind of aesthetic ontology an ontology where, unlike in the tradition in Western philosophy, you would have a dichotomy between appearance and reality. 
um, where you want to get rid of the appearance and, and reach the, the reality. In, in this more aesthetic ontology, appearance is all that we have. It's appearance all the way down. Um, which is to say that what reality finally is, is it's made of perspectives. It's made of, um, you know, as Whitehead would call them, actual occasions of experience. It's a swarm of these, these perspectives, these, um, these drops of experience that um, both are always emerging from their environmental context. So, you know, who I am in each moment is in large part determined by how I receive each of your um, attentiveness into myself. So I'm caused by my environment, and then I am a cause acting in that environment myself. So I receive the environment, I feel all of you, and then I act as a cause to then send feelings back to you. Right? So there's a, it's a two-way street here, um, but there's, the point here is that there is no underlying reality to which we are all subject. Reality itself is made of each of the perspectives that we represent. Um, so this being the case, there is, no, there is no Lord perspective that rules over all of us to make sure that we all get along, or that we all uh, are um, obeying the rules, right? We all make up the rules ourselves. The rules emerge from the ground up. Um, and this part of my title here, Love and Strife, in the Pluriverse, is a reference to the pre-Socratic uh, philosopher Empedocles, who himself was a sort of pluralist, unlike the other pre-Socratics. He didn't try to explain all of reality as, um, as all like water, as Thales did, or as all like, um, like fire, like Heraclitus, uh, or all air, or whatever. It was rather, there's, there's each of these elements, or roots as he called them, and um, they are sort of guided by these two cosmological, uh, I guess they're like divine powers or cosmological powers, love and strife. And that the whole of, of the universe or the pluriverse is engaged in this cyclic process of being at times ruled by love when strife sort of falls into the background and when love is in charge Everything is just one uniform sphere of perfection, and actually nothing much is happening. There's no differentiation. Um, but gradually, strife starts to act up and say, hey, you know, what about me down here? That perfect sphere breaks down and starts to cycle more towards chaos. But when you're in pure chaos, again, nothing much can really happen. Uh, it's too disordered. So what Empedocles suggests is that if you have love at the top and... and strife down here, where all the interesting stuff happens is actually in between, right? So you, you're, we're, we're constantly cycling through cosmos or order at the top and chaos uh, at the bottom, but it's in, in between at the edges here that life emerges and all the interesting stuff happens. Um, and for Empedocles, there was this sense that this cycle is eternal. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to suggest something a little more radical that we don't necessarily even know. The universe is so unfinished and in process that we don't really know if that cycle will continue or not. Um, everything is very much at risk uh, of, of not cycling back around. It could just fall to pieces. Um, and part of what I want to suggest, um, the the cosmological and political implications of this are is that, you know, reality is, is more like a, a creality. Let's put a C at the beginning of it. It's a creative endeavor. Um, and that we are participants in that. And to the extent that we play our role, we can continue to hold things together in a harmonious way. But without our participation, it's not like uh, there's a divine... Uh, being out there that will assure that everything will work out in the end. Um, you know, it may work out in the end, but there's, there's no certainty that that's the case, in my opinion. Um, so, so how does this then play out um, cosmologically in terms of how we understand nature and then politically in terms of how we understand 
society and how we organize ourselves. So in terms of cosmology, um, you know, instead of thinking of physics as the foundational science, what this sort of ontological pluralism and aesthetic ontology that I'm putting forward would suggest is that ecology should actually be the most foundational science because even when we're dealing with um, so-called physical um, particles, we're really talking about organisms that are interacting in, um, in larger ecologies. They're embedded in relationships with other organisms. You know, even a single hydrogen atom is a self-organizing system. It, it, was, it, it emerged historically in the course of cosmological time um, and entered into certain symbiotic relationships that would prolong uh, its lifespan. And, um, you know, a star is a colony uh, of <coughs> hydrogen and helium atoms, right? Uh, a galaxy is a colony of stars. Um, and when we think that uh, stars or galaxies or planets are somehow like eternally fixed structures that are uh, imposed on this universe from beyond due to some kind of eternal laws or something that are just written into the physical structure of the universe, I think we, we neglect the extent to which the structure that we do see is fragile and, and very well could change tomorrow. Um, the laws are not imposed from the outside, they emerge out of the behavior of all of the organisms that are making up this cosmic ecology. Uh, so just like in the realm of human society, we like to think we exist in a democracy and we make our own laws, we're self-governing. Same thing is true of nature. Um, the laws emerge from the activity, from the desires and decisions of the beings, the creatures, the organisms that make up the universe itself. They're not imposed from the outside. Um, another thing to remember is that um, you know the classical perspective about the universe is that there's a sort of single space-time fabric or some kind of universal clock that governs everything. Um, but when you consider that each form of organism has its own sensory organs, its own way of perceiving the world, and if you follow what I was saying before, that there's no like given external environment that all these organisms are subject to what the environment actually is, is just other organisms, then you see that there are um, multiple space-times brought forth by each organism's form of perception. And they're more or less overlapping, like, we're able to all meet here today at more or less the same time. Granted, we're all members of the same species, so it's easier for humans to coordinate and to live in the same space-time. Um, but we all know how how time shifts for us subjectively based on our mood, based on what we've ingested, uh, based on where we are, our level of stress, and so on. Um, those subtle differences within our own species are magnified tenfold when you move to other forms of life. So the fact that this guy and organism, this earth community that we exist as a part of, is able to hang together in the more or less coherent, co coherent way that it does is quite a miracle, and we should not take that for granted. Um, so part of what I'm trying to get across here is, is the way that, um, and we all know this with, with the ecological crisis, that there is very much a risk that the order that we're used to sustaining us could collapse. Um, there is no law sent from heaven that says it must continue to remain as organized as it has. So then, moving on to the political implications, um, you know, I kind of got into this a bit at the beginning of my talk uh, when I was talking about multiculturalism and how that that view has basically failed. Um, politics is, is an interesting word to try to define. I would just say that when we engage in politics, what we're doing is trying to compose a common world together. And we can never assume that the world's unity uh, precedes our attempt to come together to compose it. Unity must always be um, established through, you know, um, our collaboration together. Um, unity is established and, it, and remains always at risk of falling to pieces should our collaboration fail, um, should we fail to reach compromise. Um, and part of what has happened to us politically as a result of 
you know, these older forms of, of metaphysical assumptions underlying our political organization, whether monism or dualism, is that we've fallen into this uh, form of politics called identity politics, uh, which I think is related to multiculturalism, where we say, you know, I am the kind of person that I am as a sort of, you know, separate, like, substance that is unchanging and doesn't need to be in relationship. And you can be what you are with your identity over there, and as long as we keep our distance, we can kind of, uh, you know, tolerate one another, right? So there's this ethics of tolerance, and um, our politics is driven by this, this sense of my identity being different from yours, and I'll respect your identity as long as you stay over there, right? Um, it hasn't worked. The world is too interlinked and networked uh, for us to keep that distance that allows us to remain tolerant of difference. So instead of identity politics, I think we need a politics of difference, where instead of um, this metaphysics of individualism, instead we accept um, what uh, the philosopher Simon Critchley calls dividualism that I am not at one with myself. I need you to help me discover who I am. I, individualism, uh, in, individuality emerges out of relationship. We need certain kinds of communities to foster our ability uh, to act as free-thinking individuals. We don't just come out of the womb like that. Um, so it's an ethics of uh, individualism where, where we need relationship and where instead of just tolerating difference as long as it stays at a distance, we're willing to risk, always to risk our own identities uh, to transform with others. And accepting that I can't remain cooped up in my own substantial separate existence, uh, but that part of what it means to be an organism existing in an ecology of other organisms that are creating reality as they evolve is to be always at risk of waking up tomorrow as someone new. Um, so we won't move forward from our political stalemate until we each accept that risk. And what this is all moving towards, I think, is what Isabel Stengers and Bruno Latour, building on Alfred North Whitehead, these are two French uh, philosophers of science, what they call cosmopolitics. So it's a bridging of the cosmological or the natural and the political uh, or the social such that we break down that false dichotomy and instead, instead realize that you know, human society is not sequestered over here and the rest of the natural world over here. Everything humans do has some impact on the non-human community and vice versa. Um, William James, for, he's the one who coined this term uh, pluriverse, that's in my title. In his book, The Pluralistic Universe, he says that the common socius of us all is the great universe whose children we are. So cosmopolitics is just this call to recognize that human society exists within this larger Earth community and that we need to find ways of representing the voices of all the other creatures that call this planet home within our own political system uh, because they have a stake in what's going on uh, and we need them. <laughs> so, yeah, ontological pluralism. Let me know what you think about it. <laughs>
all phenomenal reality, which is like sort of like a TV screen, a blank uh, TV screen on which all phenomenal reality functions. So, you know, this obviously um, is, uh, I don't know, I mean, how do you, because this is, this is my interpretation of, I mean, since I'm engaging with you, this, this kind of ontological level, right? Yeah. This is, this is, this is, I'm uh, just wondering how you feel about that. I mean, if you, if you looked into that, how do you feel about that? Do you agree with that, you know? Well, I think part of moving into this ontological pluralism is not, it's not a rejection of that sort of more mystical form of monism that I think the non-dual schools of thought are putting forward. Um, because, you know, as a monist, as soon as you say everything is one, and you've named the one, the one then becomes sort of a thing that you've named that exists apart from everything else that isn't what you've named, and then you all, all of a sudden you're in a dualism. So, you know, as a sort of unspeakable, ineffable um, background, I think I'm totally open to that perspective. But it, it comes down to, pragmatically, when we try to um, organize nations politically, uh, or when we try to develop some sort of planetary governance, and we just say from the beginning, we are all one, is that statement um, helping us uh, create a, a more peaceful world? Or is it, is it whitewashing differences that are, are all too easily forgotten and neglected? Um, you know, so it's maybe in an unspoken way, I'm totally with you, but in terms of actually what we're able to speak about, the effable instead of the ineffable, it seems like pluralism is less dangerous. That's, that's pretty much where I'm coming from, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Fantastic all. Um, for those of you who have just arrived and are reading it more...